when uh, Jonathan was telling that story of the coffee going all over the guys, I had this memory. Jonathan and I went to college together, spent a semester rooming together. And by rooming, I mean he slept on my couch in my room. <laughs> it's true. Well, we went to this concert one time, and I was driving, and he had just gotten this full cup of coffee, and I just gunned it at the light, and it just all went over. And you did not say, enjoy grace. <laughs> that is not what you said with your face. What did I say? It was more just on your face, and it was more like you're not a human being, and I'm, I'm upset about it, yeah. So Take the long view. Long view, <laughs> long view. Here we are, all these years later. Uh, okay, a couple things. Uh, you guys have written down a lot of questions. We're not going to get to them all. They're all actually very good. So if we don't get to your question, don't think it's because we hated it. It's because there's just a lot of them. And so I'm going to try to just work through some of, some of the ones that were more commonly asked as we go. Perfect. Yeah, but I thought we'd start with a fight, uh, just to make it interesting. So thank you to this person. Provocative. This person says, I would like to hear Todd and Jonathan flesh out. Uh, thanks for leaving me out of it, too. That was gracious of you. <laughs> Pretty sure that guy doesn't know anything. I'd like to hear these other two guys <laughs> say a little bit about this. I'd like to hear Todd and Jonathan flesh out a seeming difference in approach on the importance of proximity for small groups. You both mentioned that, you complimented each other, yet there was maybe some seeming difference. And maybe if I can just pitch into that, it seemed like you were pretty more hardcore on like, you gotta do this, and you were like, do it if you can, but it's not necessary. Can you guys just maybe hash that out a little bit? I, I think it's ideal. Uh, I think there's theology for that. Um, but uh, ideal, we don't live in an ideal world, right? So there's, there's uh, practical things that make it difficult to share a zip code uh, to be in the same community. What, what Todd is doing is marvelous. I mean, who didn't think, man, I want to live in the community like that? And so it might be 10 steps away. So the question is, what would be the next step towards trying to, you know, maybe talking to some friends about, hey, what do you think one day buying a house in this neighborhood? Let's pray. I mean, we got into our neighborhood where we, the neighborhood I described that we're no longer in, um, we couldn't afford it. Um, we began praying that God would give us, and this is crazy, but they would give us $30,000. And then about two months into that prayer, someone walked in my office and said, I feel like I'm supposed to give you $30,000 for a move. Um, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, well, I guess I could say Benny Hinn now, but, you know, um, <laughs> I'm not saying health and wealth. The emphasis is on the prayer, right, and the making the steps towards shared mission in a common community. So I, I, I think my point of distinction was it's, it's ideal, um, but it's not always practical. And, um, and in, in many vo vocations and instances, it's maybe impossible. Um, but maybe there's a step you can make towards living in a shared kind of area to share community and mission. There we go. We're good. Okay. I think I'm just going to keep let, uh, let you keep talking. This will be fun, you know. This is sort of Benny Hinn, and then what comes next, you know. It's going to be great. Um, I think with respect to proximity, I would agree with what Jonathan just said, that there is a sense of ideal, and then there's a sense of real. Uh, what I particularly want to continue to challenge people to think about is we should always be pursuing ideal. That we may be far from it, but a next step is to intentionally live life with one another in the ways that God has for us. So I wouldn't disagree. I think maybe there's a sense in which I want to continue to press and call and tell people that you ought to consider this. Um, when I think about it for communities at the Austin Stone, we tend to think through four stages of how our groups uh, take shape in life towards missional community. And what we're talking about in sharing a zip code is what we call a team of missionaries. That's in a sense where people gather for community but they scatter for mission. So they're gonna go into their workplace at Dell or they're gonna engage in their neighborhood or they're gonna try to share the good news as they're downtown working out of a WeWork facility. Uh, but they're gonna come back together always as a community to encourage one another in that. And we, we love that, we celebrate that, we think that's amazing. But as Jonathan said, that's leaving one of the best weapons for the apologetic of the gospel, which is your Christian community who has the Holy Spirit. And so we want to be a community that's not just pursuing life as a team of missionaries, but truly as a missionary team, that we're intentionally overlapping rhythms of life together so that we can show our lost neighbors 
what it looks like as a chorus, not just as a single voice. And so, um, same idea, just maybe a little bit more emphasis in pushing people that direction. And I might add another caveat in the other direction. We have people, all of our groups are geographically based, but inevitably someone will want to join a group because they know a person in a group. If they're a mature Christian, we feel like we can have that conversation and say, you know, missions really kind of geographically, these are geographically based, and we think it'd be better for you to, to find one in your area. If they're not a Christian, or if they have some deep uh, kind of pastoral needs, and this relationship is part of God is using to meet that need, we're not going to have that conversation with them. We'll put the, the pastoring ahead of the mission for that for, for a season. And then as they grow and mature, they may uh, then come under the conviction that, like, you know, I need to either move into the neighborhood or join one in my area or something like that. That's good. Uh, I think both of you guys mentioned this, and I would just add, uh, you can, you can, there's lots of ways to think about mission. My advice is don't get locked into any particular definition of it. Like, if you're just trying to, like, help people know Jesus and invite them into community, you're doing it, okay? Um, but one thing is there's, there's, like, when a group intentionally moves into a space, whether it is a mercy ministry or a neighborhood or whatever it is, the group is doing the mission together. But we, you also all have your sort of individual vocation and community missions. I like to think about how can I bring my, my group into that in some way. So third spaces are great. We used to throw a um, Cinco de Mayo party. I would invite 50 or 60 people from my neighborhood, 50 or 60 people from our church, and put them all in my front yard. And one time, my uh, Saeed, my neighbor, two doors down, he comes up to me and he's like, all these people go to your church? I said, yeah. He goes, but they're interesting. <laughs> And I was like, well, Saeed, can Christians not be interesting? He goes, I've never met one. And it was weird because I'd known him for like two years at that point, you know. <laughs> and so, but I, I honestly just don't connect with him over a lot of stuff. Uh, but, but Murat, who's here today, did. And so I have neighbors in my neighborhood who have gone to dinner at my friends' houses who don't live in our neighborhood multiple times because they met at this party. And so I just like to think about how, how can I just bring my friends into my other spaces and, and I get into their spaces with them as well. So, Todd, uh, you talked a little bit about multiplying mission in your community, doing mission in your community. Uh, someone maybe just wants to know, like, how can you, what are some ways that you live on mission with your group? How do you invite people in to, to the, your community? Uh, are we talking new people or are we talking kind of lost people from our neighborhood? I literally only know the same words that I just said just to said, you. Just okay, so, well, yeah. can you help me by clarifying <laughs> the question? <laughs> uh, I take it to mean how do, you, how do you invite people in your neighborhood, non-Christians, unchurched, into your community, Christian community? Yeah, I, I think that kind of um, goes back to the structures that we use, and there's a really deliberate reason that we gather what we call life transformation groups, family meals, and third places. Um, for us, the way our community gathers in rhythms provides space where somebody from our neighborhood who maybe we know, uh, say Nick and Sarah, as we're engaging in soccer or PTA, it's invitation, like your children are already playing. Uh, or I'll use the case study from last night, our porch party. Uh, so our neighbor Heather doesn't know Jesus, uh, but we had a couple other folks hanging around. So it's just this environment where we're deliberately engaging and open to people in our neighborhood to see our Christian community. Um, the next invitation is, well, if you've gotten to know us and you're curious maybe what our community looks like in a more structured way, come join us for a family meal. And so we'll do those typically on Sunday afternoons now, although we've done a variety of different expressions. And so um, Nick and Sarah have joined us several times as we gather around the meal. And sometimes we'll actually even practice communion, the Lord's Supper together. And so that's really a fun conversation. We have somebody who doesn't know Jesus and you're as a community practicing the Lord's Supper together. It's like, hey, this is a wonderful thing, but this is really what Christians do. And so we're going to ask that you maybe not do this with us. Now, we've had that conversation, like embrace the awkwardness that comes and provoke the next steps of conversation. Nick and Sarah don't run away from us. They just realize this is something that Christians do. And then finally, I've actually had friends, I haven't experienced it myself, who they invited a lost person to join them in a life transformation group. That's like, we're going to hold each other accountable to reading God's Word, we're going to confess sin, and we're going to talk about sharing the good news. Uh, one of my best college leaders actually came to Christ through that very thing. He was invited into a life transformation group and came to Christ. So, all that to say, you can invite people even on Sundays, you know, it's a wonderful thing to invite people to, but all of those environments you can actually be inviting. It's just how do I actually think about translating it for them as they're experiencing it? Yeah. I think we, we, we all feel like it's going to be weird for an unchurched person or a non-Christian person to, like, do the things that Christians do because we're weird. 
And it totally is going to be weird. But don't underestimate just how desperately people want to belong. Oh, yeah. They will go to a group that is about nothing that they're interested in just to belong to that group. And, and then that begins to begin context of change for them. So um, I, I'd say invite people in and err on that side of just being awkward and dialoguing about that. I feel like we should ask the introvert what he would do. How do you invite people <laughs> in? Do you want to talk about that? Um. <laughs> he would write a book about it. <laughs> Want to join my book club? Yeah. <laughs> I wrote it. <laughs> We're going to move on. Okay. Uh, I mentioned at the end of my session, off the cuff, off the cuff comments always get questions. Um, just that it can't be the same person's life who you're working on every week. And uh, somebody wants to, their question is, well, what if it is? Like, so in your group, you've got the same person every week. It's hard because this is a person in need, and so you want to be compassionate, and, and people are talking, so this seems like it's going well. But I'm just telling you, um, and we've had this multiple times in our church, uh, if that happens, it's going to drain the rest of the group. I think a group is willing to like engage in somebody's mess for a couple of weeks, three weeks maybe at a time. But after that, it's like, hey, we, there's like 12 other people or sometimes 30 other people. We've got to like share the love a little bit. And so what you have to do is you just have to have a hard conversation, not in the group, but take the person out. Say, hey, I am so grateful that you've been sharing. I think we're making a lot of progress. Here's what I think we're at now. I think that we're at the point where your needs are sort of exceeding what we can accomplish in our group time. And so I would love to keep walking through this with you. I'd love to connect you to counseling or someone in our church where we can continue to like hash through this stuff. But I think when it comes to group time, I'd love it if maybe we like just look left some space from other people begin to share. Look, some people are going to get offended because that, it, it's kind of, that person is usually pretty sensitive and we've had one person just like leave the group because of that. And that's really hard, but I, I think it's like the best thing for your group. Um, we can still maintain those relationships outside of it, but it's just, it's always going to be a hard conversation, but you got to have that. that would be my advice. While I was answering, I couldn't get the next question. Hang on. Uh, this is interesting. So, Todd, you talked about uh, crisis opportunities. The way the question is phrased, um, how might we help creating crisis opportunities? They don't mean how, <laughs> what, what it sounds like. They don't mean what it says. Do I get to tell a fun story real fast? You can, but here's what they mean, and then you can answer the question. They mean just the crises are already there, and so maybe as a leader, you know that she's got this going on, he's got this going on, this is happening over here, but the group doesn't know, and they don't want to talk about it. So what they mean is, how do we, like, bring these to the surface in the group? Yeah, that's good. Well, that ruins the funny story I was going to tell. Uh, you know, I think in involving um, groups into private and personal conversations, you have to be really careful about how and when you do that. So first and foremost, it's speaking with the person who's experiencing that and getting an understanding of a couple of things. One how ready are you to invite people into this? And then two, who do you feel safe actually sharing this with? And so before you even step towards inviting those kinds of things into a group discussion, have some intentional conversation prior. Then two, I think, is recognizing that involving maybe two or three is a better first step than if your group is 15 or 20 or something along those lines. That can be a very difficult step for someone to take. So inviting maybe two or three members from the group to come and be a part of the process of care, of exhortation, and of um, continuing the dialogue around those pains. And then finally, it's asking permission to share that with other people inside of the community so that they can be intentional in prayer for that person. So that's just an easier and softer way to kind of bring it up and say, hey, giddy up, share it with everybody like right now. So, yeah. That's good. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, sometimes I'll ask someone, hey, we've been talking about this for a while. Is this something you'd be willing to share with the city group? And just let them, let that become an option. Yeah. You know, so just, and then the, when they're ready, they're ready. Sometimes those things come out when there's a smaller group of people, I've noticed, too. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, I don't want to share it with 20, but if we have a small showing, some of those deeper things will come out, and it, you can celebrate that. Yeah. Th this relates to, um, somebody asked the question, just how do you cultivate vulnerability in your group? Um, so asking people to just share their story in your group or part of their story in your group will do that really well. So as a leader, you're aware of stuff. It's like, hey, would you mind just just sharing this part of your story. You don't have to tell the whole thing. 
Uh, you can also, I mean, a lot of groups will just take some time. So um, one of our elders is here. When they started their group, they just decided, here's what we're going to do each week. One person is going to share their, their we're gonna, they have the whole night. They're just going to share their story. We're going to ask questions. We're going to engage and get to know them. It took some time, and they just went through the whole group like that. Uh, what that did eventually, though, was opened up space where people felt known and, and able to share, like, the last 10% stuff that has completely revolutionized their group. And so when you talk about creating crises, multiple people in that group were in some, like, serious crises of addiction and other things. Nobody knew it until one guy finally was like, all right, fine, here it is. Shared it. The whole group engaged. I mean, there were literally interventions involved. I mean, it was like an all-hands-on-deck kind of thing. And that started to create space where people felt like, oh, wow, you, in this group, if you share your crisis, you get help. And so somebody else shared their crisis. And then somebody else, you know, brought their neighbor who was having all these needs. And all these people jumped into, like, complicated health care issues and all these things helping this person kind of get back on his feet. It's probably, like, maybe the most engaging group we have. But it began with just asking people to share their stories. And, and that began to surface some of the crises that were, that were going on, which is good. Um, to you, both of you guys, there's a, there's a variety of questions that are related to both you talked about needing to sacrifice. Um, both of you talked a little bit about um, like moving toward mission, getting people to live like on mission outside the group. I think some of the questions are like, okay, how, how do you get people to do that that don't want to do that? People that don't want to sacrifice, people that don't want to like, they want to talk about mission, but they don't want to go do it on a Tuesday night or whatever it is. As a leader, just how do you motivate and get people to and mobilize people to do that? I think what Jonathan landed on is critically important, that the Spirit is the one who bears witness to the risen Lord Jesus. And so, in a sense, if we're going to call people to mission, we're calling them to life in the Spirit. And I think one of the things we did early at the Austin Stone was calling people to mission without actually a recognition that it's going to require the Holy Spirit to do that. And that just creates Pharisees, honestly. It creates people who are either missionally righteous or completely deflated and unrighteous because they can't do it. So I think that's really important to emphasize as you're thinking about calling people to mission. On a practical note, um, I think it's a couple of things. One is recognizing that mission often doesn't bring you personal benefit. Mission is not something that actually brings you gain. It may bring you a sense of satisfaction or joy, but long-term enduring mission is not something you're getting from it. It's something you actually are giving, and it requires the power of the Holy Spirit to keep doing it. Um, I think secondly is casting vision for what it can look like. I think people need to have a different narrative than just whatever they lock into their head. So if you just say mission, 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 they'll just attach whatever they think is in their head. If you say, what would it look like for you to go across the street, to knock on a door, and say, Casey and Amy, how are you doing right now? That's a different way in which you can cast vision for what the very same thing we're talking about is. So casting vision. And then three is intentional prayer. I do really believe that prayer is the bedrock that will move people who don't seem to desire to go on mission uh, to actually take some steps because it's the spirit that's actually going to do that. Um, finally is show them. Uh, I think we can tell all day long. I think you actually have to show people how to do it, and so that's why my home is always open. That's why I'm continuing to invite people along with me, but just show, don't tell would be the final thing I would say. John, any thoughts? So you're a small group leader. You're fired up about particular aspects of mission. Your group likes to talk about that, but they're not showing up. They're not doing it. What, what do you, how do you move them toward it? Um, I mean, there, there can be just the why question. Guys, I sense there's not a lot of interest in this. I see only a couple of us seem to be interested. Why is that? I mean, there's, there, there's always a motivational reason. And uh, I think it is good to cast vision and, and um, give examples and modeling all that. But we might need to get underneath why. And you got into some of that, maybe the, the righteousness and the unrighteousness, you know, idolizing it. Man, I could never be that great. I could never do that. Or there may be a love of comfort, you know, like I just love Netflix and pizza too much you Amen. know um you know but let's get real like guys we, we it's clear that the mission is god is a missionary god and he made us in his image in christ to be a missionary so why how are we how are we falling short of living out who we are in christ what, what is it that's holding us back and then i would want to just pastor them through their answers you know to 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 jesus so can you guys maybe speak to the leader in this room who's just like really frustrated with the lack of action in their group? 
like like angry, frustrated, just like forget it. I'm gonna go do something else. I'm like, you know that kind of thing. Do you need some counseling, Will? I've got some people like that. I want you guys to <laughs> do my work for me. You know, I think one that's been deeply convicting for me is that anger, at least in the way that I often experience it, is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so first and foremost, if you're frustrated or angry with the people that you lead, chances are good there's wickedness in your own heart. And there is a process that's called repentance that you probably need to work through. Um, I would sit down with Will and talk about it with him about, hey, why are you angry? And uh, let's, let's work through a process of asking that very same question that Jonathan is talking about. I do think, too, that there is a sense in which um, we can persist so long with hard-hearted and disobedient people uh, well beyond, I think, what is actually good and right and godly. And so, when I look at, you know, Jesus kind of in his apostolic model of ministry, uh, going two by two, home to home, town to town, there's a sense in which it is okay in a season, after you've been long suffering, after you've worked through your own wickedness, to say, maybe the next thing for me is a new season of ministry that's not with these particular people. Now, we could get into that more, I think, later, but I do think that there is a freedom that can come if you've persisted with people for a time. Then you've worked through your own issues to say the next step for me may not be with this group of people. Um, one, of the, one of the ways we talk about this at City Life is that um, mission is a bad master. So um, if you're serving master mission, Lord mission, and you're doing really well, he can look like a good master. Oh, man, people are responding to my evangelistic conversations. We're really making some headway in the neighborhood. Um, man, I've, we've been doing some good stuff, you know, when the mercy, you can, you can get a lot of attaboys and kind of payback, emotional payback from that. But when, when it, when it dips, when you become spiritually dry or you're ineffective, um, you, you begin to think worse of yourself, right? So you've got a, a pride from above and a pride from below that's operating. Master mission is a, is a bad master. So when you fail him and you will, um, you, he'll, you'll come along and he'll, you'll fall on the ground and he'll kick you when you're down. He'll mock, he'll say, see, you're not a good evangelist. You don't care about the poor. You don't care about racial reconciliation. And you just, you know, master mission is onerous. Now let's put that next to master Jesus. When you fail master Jesus, what does he do? Does, does he kick you on the ground? Does he mock you? Does he say, did you not read the Bible? No, he dies for you. And maybe in your anger, you need to look at that Jesus again, that master who dies for you and dies for other people who struggled to be on mission and, and get on board with repenting, turning back, looking at that master who is so gracious and so merciful in our struggles to be obedient in, in mission. I literally almost cried just now. That was so good. That was really good. Yours was good, too. I don't serve master approval idol Yours any longer. Yours was good, too. Um, I really, it re reminded me, I really appreciated what you said about taking the long view of people. I really think that's a helpful thing in our groups on a variety of subjects. But here's what happens as a small group leader. You have above you, whatever, some pastor is in charge of small groups or the lead pastor, and there are actual expectations they have, and then on top of that, there's a whole bunch of expectations that you think they have or that you've projected on yourself. And so your whole, like, metric for what a good small group is is, is off base. It's based on all these expectations. And you get stuck trying to meet all of that rather than just paying attention to the people that you have. Mm. And if you weren't worried about, like, producing, then you would be free to just say, you know what, in five years, I really think this guy's going to be a good place. And I hope he's still in our group because I want to see that. We're just going to, like, bear with this guy and keep, you know, you, you would be free to do that because you wouldn't feel any pressure, right? And so let me just say, I, I don't think in your churches there's half the pressure you think there is on you as a leader. I think you're very free just to, like, pay attention to your people and, and walk with them and do that. Let me switch gears a little bit to more community-oriented stuff. Uh, one question is, is just practical advice of getting people to live life together outside of the gathering. So what would you guys say to that? Or what have you seen be successful? I think there's a stage of life where that is easier than other stages of life. The less uh, 
discretionary time that you have, um, i.e. children, <laughs> uh, the more you're able to do the community events, the more children you have, it can be harder, unless it's uh, convenient, uh, to, to do those community events. My, my, I have a 14, 13 year old and a nine year old, and I, I've been telling some people recently, I, we have less capacity for hospitality and kind of uh, the, that kind of unplanned community type stuff than we've ever had. And I was talking to my wife about it, and we, we agreed that we needed to recognize like that's a season that God has us in, and we don't need to live in guilt about it. One of the things that, that we, we've said over the years is like your door should be open. You know, it's like open door policy. You know, your door should be open. For some people, it's, a, it's open 100 all the way, you know, 100%. Um, Todd is an extrovert. Maybe the door is open 100%. Some people, it might be 50%. In some seasons, it might be 20%. There may be a season where it needs to get really close. You always want to be in, in touch with the people of God. But I think we have to evaluate seasons and stages of life, whether it's work, family, whatever, and be principally committed to hospitality because God is so hospitable towards us in Christ, but recognize there are seasons in which we may be doing a lot, we may be doing less. Yeah. I think <clears throat> I am an extreme extrovert, uh, but in this season of life, there is uh, a sense and awareness that the volume of people that I have discipled, the volume of people that I have shepherded, the volume of people that are just in our everyday life does get a bit overwhelming. And it's like, how am I going to steward all of these different relationships? And so we've talked about that reality is we have to think, at least biblically, how we are going to prioritize our time with the volume of people that we care about. And so for us, we've kind of gone back to the basics and said, what's a framework that we can use to assess who and how we're going to invest time in? And so for me and for my wife, what we've talked about is the very first call that Jesus gives is to be a disciple. And so if we're too busy doing hospitality or throwing events or doing those kinds of things to be a disciple of Jesus, we have a problem. We've gone out of bounds. And so for us, we talk about discipleship through the lens of our covenant membership commitments at the Austin Stone. If we're not fulfilling those things, we're not being disciples. The second biblically obedient aspect of my life is to be a husband to my wife. Because God gave her to me, my stewardship and my calling is to be a husband, and therefore I need to rightly prioritize being a husband of my wife. So I'm a disciple first, I'm a husband second, I'm a father third because God blessed the fruit of our marriage five times over. We now have a gaggle of children that we have to care for, and so we need to be faithful parents, a faithful father and a faithful mother. Then fourth, I actually have a calling because the church has uh, called, qualified, and affirmed me in the office of elder that I'm specifically supposed to do the ministry of the Word and ministry of prayer. And so I have to be faithful to that calling. Finally, I have a vocation, which just so happens to align with my calling, and I need to be a faithful executive pastor of ministry strategies at the Austin Stone. Then everything else on top of that, coaching soccer, engaging in PTA, doing some new thing, is actually negotiable. Those five things are non-negotiable because they're aspects of biblical obedience. So I hope that's helpful maybe for you as you're thinking about prioritizing relationship and how you might invest more faithfully in a few and a lot. Let me give you a couple quick tips on just like trying to get people to connect outside of your group because I think that's an important part of, of group life. Um, I do appreciate a lot of the like, hey, don't force it just because you think that's some expectation that a group is supposed to have, but you can cultivate it. So one thing is um, what I find a lot of leaders doing is taking on all of the tasks. It's like, oh, people are supposed to connect outside of groups, so I got to do that now too. Just please, for the love of God, get somebody else in your group to own that. Right, And so we had a group that literally, I mean, these are adults, and they created a fun committee in their group. And it's just a group of people like, hey, we're the fun committee, and we're going to take... be on that committee? Yeah. We're going to take charge of just creating fun stuff for our group. There wasn't, like, pressure for everybody in the group to show up at stuff. It was just like, this is happening. This is where structure becomes really important. I, I would be up for hanging out a lot. It's just, I don't, because it's not, it's not like there's not a structure and opportunity to do that. So if your group just says, hey, we're doing this thing... Every, you know, so a lot of our singles groups used to do or maybe still do um, just like regular happy hours. It's like, hey, this is happening. Tuesday happy hour, RGC, it's happening, which is an also, also a missional opportunity, like bring coworkers to hang out with your group. But just because of the structure was there, people can engage in it. And, and by all means, get a fun committee going to get that stuff 
plan so that you don't have to do that. A, a lot of the balls in your group that are dropping are because you're trying to hold them all. And so just figure out what, what are the things that our group needs? Oh, we need to hang out with each other. Who in our group seems really good at coordinating that kind of stuff and has energy for that? And can I just give that to them? And then they'll champion it, and it'll be better because it's like their one thing that they're doing in your group. Um, also, I would just say uh, it's, it's related to that, but for us personally, just getting it on the calendar is everything. If it's on the calendar, it'll probably happen. If it's not, it won't. And so we're just kind of like, hey, uh, my wife who's introverted is like, hey, I can't have people over every night, so let's figure out what's the good rhythm. So we just decided every other Monday night we're leaving it open, and we're going to try to have somebody over for dinner in our group or somebody we know in our community uh, just to try to hang out outside the group. But real simple, th I think structure is really important there. Don't underestimate the importance of just having some, some solid structure, simple structure for that. Okay, do, this is a great question. Do we hold people accountable for attending group? If so, how? Or do we just continue to extend grace in that? People who are, you know, in your group, on the roster, but you never see them. What's, what's the, every church is going to differ probably on how they'd handle this, so this will be fun to talk about. Well, I mean, Scripture tells us not to forsake the assembling, assembling together. It tells us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly as a community, to speak psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, to love one another, to bear one another's burdens. So my question would be, how are you doing that if you're not part of this group? So I, 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 will, I mean, that is accountability, but I kind of want to get, get back to Scripture and then kind of like, is there a reason why you're not? participating? Were you offended? Were you hurt? Were you alienated? Um, is there some something that you're hiding that you feel like you can't share? Um, so again, when you get into some of the motivations of why they're not part, recognizing that it is a biblical thing and there are a lot of good life-giving things that we do as a community, um, but may, maybe this isn't the community for you. Uh, maybe there's, uh, but maybe there's, there's some sin that needs to, so I want to, I want to, and I, I don't, we, we don't always do it, do it well, but I want to find out, I want to have a one-to-one -one with that person and check in or encourage someone in our group to connect with them and kind of find out what's going on. That's good. So just, I do hear you saying, yes, we hold people accountable, but it's not just like, hey, why aren't you a group? I mean, you said you'd be a group, but it's like really digging into like what's going on in their life. Are there real good reasons for that that we need to move into? And that's really good. What would you add? Like 5,000 things. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and I, I know they're enumerated, so let's go. <laughs> let's go right now. One, two, three. Here we go. Um, I think with respect to covenant membership, right, that this is a theological construct for many of the churches that are here, that there's a sense in which we say, yes, we want to be held accountable. Now, your church likely has covenant membership commitments or something along those lines, and that's what we've chosen to hold people accountable to at the Austin Stone, is over the course of a year, how are you faithfully striving by the grace of God through the power of the Holy Spirit to live these biblically mandated things out? Now, would I take attendance every single week in a missional community of the Austin Stone? Absolutely not. That sounds like an epic nightmare to me, uh, mostly on the administrative side. I have the gift of administration, and I still don't don't want to be the guy uh, taking attendance every single week. But the construct that we've used for accountability in smaller communities is people who've said yes to mission. Don't assume that everybody wants to go where you're going. And we're not going to hold people accountable who don't want to go that direction. But people who've said, yes, I'm called of God to be a part of this small community who's pursuing this mission together, then I think you have warrant for accountability in that group. But it's not about attendance. It's about participation. Are you actually engaged in with your life what Jesus has called us to, not just attending a function that uh, we can assess whether or not you're there or present? So I would say no, uh, in a sense, at the Austin Stone, although we have some of those metrics, but do hold people accountable, like Jonathan is talking about, who said yes to mission and how they're engaging in that mission over time. Yeah, so like in our church, part of a membership commitment is that you're in a small group. You have to be in a small group to even go through membership. Not everybody does that, but you can see where in our church, it's like it's, it's bigger than your group. This is part of your commitment to membership is to be faithful in this group. And so we ask our leaders to, you know, chase down everybody that's said yes to membership and that isn't showing up, isn't faithfully present. And if they need help chasing, then let me, let me chase too. That'd be fun. Um, people outside of that, you know, people that haven't committed to membership, they're just checking things out. 
the invitation is strong. We, we, we pursue people, we invite, but we're not, we're not holding them accountable to something that they haven't, haven't committed to, if that helps. So, how There's, do you hold them accountable? Just have that conversation. Most of the answers to the stuff that you're wrestling with, the answer is just, you got to just have that conversation. And I know you want there to be some other answer, which is why you keep asking the questions, but that is the answer. Just move into that and have the conversation and, and trust the Spirit's leading and grace to kind of work it out and work through you. So, I often ahead. say we're like the Home, du- uh, Home Depot. You can do it. We can help. So yeah. <laughs> you can have the conversation. We can help you have the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. um, Okay. I like this. How do you guys uh, deal with um, different theologies within the group? So let's just say people have different positions on name your topic, sexuality, um, there, or people are just unrepentant sin in the group, and people don't see it and don't want to deal with it in the group. Those are kind of two different questions, but they're both here. Let's do it with different theologies. People are just have different views on stuff, and it comes up in group. How do you, how do you address that? Part of me wants to joke right now. I don't think it's appropriate. I don't think it's the right time. No, I don't think so. <laughs> um, you know, again, what we teach and train on often is the principle of Matthew 18. So, uh, with respect to doctrine or to sin, I think the first step is always an individual approaching the other individual. And, um, you know, just last week I had someone come and share with me that they thought that someone was living in gross moral error. And I was like, well, have you actually spoken with that person about that? And their answer was, you know, kind of, no. And I was like, well, go talk to them. That's your biblical responsibility in this moment is to go have that conversation. So, lest I beat a dead horse, Will, we're just going to say, go have the conversation like the Scriptures outlined for you to do it. That's first step. So, so what about if you're a leader and it's just like in the group, so everybody's seeing it, people are voicing different opinions and theologies. How do you navigate that in a group? I mean... One of the things that we, we try to practice is, is, across the church is the essentials unity and the non-essentials diversity and all things charity. Um, as a peer, Rupert Muldenzi. So there are essential things that, that we need to believe that are essential to salvation, right? That Jesus is God, that he, that he died and rose again. Like, there, there are essentials that you need to be a Christian. Um, there are non-essentials that are essential to salvation. Are they important? Yes. Are they essential to, to being saved and justified and, you know, a new creation? No, they're not. Um, and there are different views on the non-essentials. And in all things, we want to talk about this charitably. And so we try to cultivate a climate like that. In a group, you could have partners that are committed, that are all in, not just on the essentials, but on where the church stands on non-essentials, Okay. And then you're going to have people who are not on the same page on the non-essentials, and they're not partners of the group or members of the church. Um, and so that, that's where the conversations can get interesting. Um, I think in, in my experience where there's different theologies, we try to create, if, if they're not a partner and they have a different theology, if they are a partner and they're developing a different theology, then there's um, a more kind of sit-down, serious conversation that they have their theological com- convictions have changed, and they're out of step with the church's theological convictions and out of step with membership. That's a different conversation where an elder would get involved and has gotten involved. Um, but if it's in the group where there's different theological convictions and you have partners and non-partners, I think we want to create space to talk about that. It will become clear as we talk about that where, where the church's position is and where the partners of the church stand but there's space to talk about it. I mean, my goodness, like we, we've got to have room to kind of figure out what we believe. And if you can't do that in the church, then where are you going to do it? I mean, you're going to just punt and, not, and just come up with your, a different set of beliefs. So we've got to, to, to be large hearted about some of these conversations and be willing to kind of uh, talk about them, not only in the, the meeting. And sometimes we'll say, I've said many times, that's a great question. We should have that conversation another time. Like, literally said that so many times in a group. This is a very important topic, but it's not what we're talking about right now. Um, I can get coffee with you. Maybe three of us could call, talk about it next week. So there, there are spaces for those working out those theological differences. Um, sometimes that's in the community, but often it, it requires space and time outside of the community because the whole community isn't concerned about it. It's just one or two people. 
I think one of the things that leaders feel on, on any given night is like you got to put a bow on every night. Like everything has to resolve or it was a bad group. That's actually probably not a good way of thinking about it. In fact, tension seeks resolution. And so if the group ends and there's tension, what you might find out is that people in your group are going like, to get together later that week because they can't stand it. they got to resolve it. They're going to get a book. They're going to meet with a the pastor. They're going to do something. And so as a leader, I don't expect our leaders to resolve everything. If there's different views coming up in the group, it's okay just to say, man, these are really different views. And, and don't avoid the tension. If everybody in your group can see it, just acknowledge it so that you can kind of diffuse it. So this is a lot of different views. I don't really know uh, how, to, how to go forward here. So why don't we spend a little bit of time in prayer, and then maybe we'll connect and kind of follow some of this up later this week. Just, just call it what it is. Don't feel like you've got to fix it. And just move on. Do you have something? Well, I just thought of an example. In our, uh, a few months ago in our community group, we had uh, a guy who was... Um, uh, the guy I mentioned, William from San Francisco, was doing was an activist in doing uh, women's marches, justice marches, race marches. Then we had another guy in our group. We talked about this all the same night. He was saying um, that he wanted to go and uh, picket and pray at abortion clinic. So you got two extremes in one group. And so I tried to facilitate a conversation. How do you think? What do you think about his his expression of mission? What do you think about? His expression, and we just, and then other people pitched in, and you know, we, we were able to have a conversation. And one of the things I tried to bring our attention to, it was fairly civil, is that one. I said to them, that one of the things I love about this church is that um, if our identity is in Christ, um, it frees us to be wrong in areas where we might disagree, because our 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 worth isn't tied to being right on a political perspective or 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 anything for that matter. So. So we, we talked about how when the essentials are Jesus, and the essentials are unity and non-essentials diversity, Jesus gives us a worth, a significance, a sense of um, uh, acceptance that frees us to engage these conversations in a way that isn't heated and angry and uh, coercive and mean-spirited, but actually can take the posture of humility to learn and to listen, maybe even be corrected. Um, and so, so, you know, again... Gospel centrality gets traction in these kind of conversations. If we are finding our worth and identity in our union with Christ, well, we, we can pursue truth and we can be free to be wrong because it, our righteousness is in Christ. That's great. That, that really connects to this last question, and then we're going to end. Someone says, um, explain the difference in trying to fix it and offering advice or counsel. And um, there's probably a lot of ways to think about this. Um, but I think what Jonathan just said illustrated the difference. So you, you do have good counsel and advice, but if you offer counsel and advice without listening and understanding the person's story, then it comes across as, I'm just going to fix you, rather than try to like understand you. The other thing I would say is, you may offer counsel and advice that in your mind is deeply rooted in gospel truth, but you have to explicitly connect the dots with the people that you're giving that advice to. Hey, here, here's some counsel, here's a way forward I think that would be helpful, but let's talk about Let's talk about some of the realities that's rooted in and help that person source that application in who they are in Christ and what the gospel is for them. Does that make sense? doesn't matter if it does. You can't say anything. So, <laughs> Can I actually comment on that real yeah. fast? Because yeah, and then we're going to close. I think the Austin Stone went through kind of this gospel fluency renaissance, which is an extraordinarily helpful way of applying the gospel into our own lives. But I do think there's a next step beyond that gospel centrality, and it's word centrality. It's taking the next step to say the gospel is a way of talking about God's Word, but then let's also be precise about applying specific text in these circumstances. Let's not just lean on a framework. Let's press in and learn more and engage more so that chapter and verse are coming to mind, not merely kind of a rehearsed framework for how we deal with things. Yeah, if you don't have versus biblical arguments related to your counsel, then you might just be trying to fix it a little bit. All right. Guys, thanks so much for giving up a, a beautiful Saturday to be in here. I hope this was helpful for you. hope it challenged the right things. hope it'll be fruitful, most of all, in your churches as you go back. Uh, I think somebody mentioned this. Don't go back and say, here, I have this thing of stuff that we're going to now dump on the small group all at once. Try to sort through with the Lord and with, with people in your community what are like one or two things we need to try to start implementing and see some progress in, and then we'll, we'll get to the rest of the stuff. Let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll dismiss. Uh, Father, as has been said so many times today, uh, you are so gracious to us, so generous, 
so kind, so faithful. And we uh, claim all of those attributes, all of those realities about your love and your commitment to us for our groups. We as leaders are not those things perfectly. And what our groups need more than good leaders and good structures and good ideas is just a real experience with you and your mercy toward them, your kindness and your grace in their lives, your strength and power and truth in their lives. And so we ask that you would take all of this stuff and by the wisdom and power of your spirit, uh, make it real in our groups and so that Jesus might become more real to our people. We ask it in his name. Amen.